So one of the most common questions I see on social media over and over again is how to catch shad, where to find shad, what kind of net to use to catch shad. So today I'm gonna to try to make a quick video. I'm gonna share with you guys all the stuff I've learned over the past few years. Hopefully it'll help some of you guys out. So when I first started throwing a cast net and catching my own shad, guys, I would get a five foot cast net from Walmart, the kind with the little plastic weights on them. I'd head out to the lake or river, and I wouldn't even turn my fish finder on. I would just go out, I'd find a flat somewhere, and I'd just start throwing my net. And, you know, there were some days when I would catch bait pretty quick because the shad were there really thick. But uh, most of the time, I spent several hours throwing my net just to get enough bait to fish with for a few hours. And there were some days when I went out there, threw my net until my arm was ready to fall off and just couldn't come up with any bait. So if this sounds familiar to any of you guys, I feel your pain. And if you take the time to watch this video, I think that I can help you. So let's get right to it, guys. So I wish that I could tell you guys that there was a magical place out there in every body of water that was loaded with the size shad that you were trying to catch year round. But shad are no different than any other fish and they're constantly on the move depending on weather conditions, water conditions. But there are a lot of places that seem to hold shad more consistently throughout the year. And a lot of this depends on whether you have current or no current. So we'll start out by talking about where to find shad when you're in a river. Below dams is one of the best places without a doubt year round to find shad. Sometimes you'll find them in the really turbulent water right below the dam. Sometimes you'll find them in slack water, but most of the time they will be there somewhere. So this video clip right here is actually from this past weekend. We went up to a dam, wasn't really seeing anything on the fish finder. We got right up to the base of the dam. We started marking some bait. We threw our net just a handful of times and filled up a five gallon bucket with 10 to 15 inch shad. So just be very careful and pay attention to the water. Don't get caught up in what you're doing to get too close to one of these dams. The only reason we were able to get this close to this dam is because the water was extremely low this day. Uh, but even then, you still want to keep your distance. Uh, a lot of these dams have undertow on them. If you get too close, they'll start pulling you towards them, and there's really not much you can do. But check out the size of these shad right here, guys. These are the kind that I'm always looking for. Creek mouse and backwaters also create a current break and a place for shad to get away from predators. And in the winter time, these creeks and backwaters will also warm up a whole lot faster than the main river, and that'll attract the shad also. Basically, any slack water that I can find when I'm in current, is I'll definitely check it out and see what's there. So when I go to a lake to find shad, I have to change up my tactics some because you don't have the current to put these shad in predictable places, and it can be kind of tough sometimes. Boat ramps, any kind of concrete, marinas, flats are all great places to look for shad in a lake with no current. But my absolute favorite place to catch shad is underneath lights at night. The plankton is attracted to the lights, and the shad follow the plankton. It's a great way to load up on shad really quick a lot of times. You may not find them under every light, but if you find the right area and it's got light above it, there's gonna be some shad there more than likely. Another way to locate shad on a lake is pay attention to which direction the wind's blowing. The plankton stays towards the top of the water. The wind a lot of times can blow the plankton to one side of the lake or another. So you can go to the bank that the wind's blowing into and a lot of times you'll find those shad feeding on those plankton. But the best advice I can give anybody on catching shad, no matter where you're at, lake or river, is learn to put your faith in your fish finder when you're catching your bait. It'll save you a lot of time, a lot of money. It doesn't matter if you have a $100 fish finder or a $5,000 fish finder, it will show you if you're around bait or not. Here's a few examples of bait on different fish finders. And it's going to look different depending on what size shad you're looking for. Normally, I'm trying to catch shad to use for catfish. So I'm looking for the bigger shad, six to eight inches and even bigger. If you're looking for smaller shad, they're, of course, they're going to appear smaller on the screen. You just have to find out what shad look like on your unit, and that's going to make life a whole lot easier for you. Another great thing about using your fish finder to catch shad 
is you can look at the bottom before you throw your net to make sure there's no structure down there that you're going to hang your net into. But trust me on this, guys. If you start using your fish finder to locate your shad, you're going to start catching more shad more consistently, and you're going to learn what size shad you're looking at on your screen. You're going to know whether it's a waste of time or not. So after you find your bait, obviously the next step is going to be catching your bait. But not all cast nets are the same. And there's three things that I look for when choosing a cast net. That's pounds per foot, mesh size, and the radius of the net. You always want to match the size mesh to the size bait that you're trying to catch. This will allow the smaller shad to pass through the net, leaving only the bigger shad in the net. I don't use any shad less than six inches, so I throw three quarter to one inch mesh only. The bigger the mesh, the less water resistance it has as it's falling through the water, which allows it to sink faster. The faster the net sinks, the more shad you're gonna catch, and that's why pounds per foot is so important. In my opinion, you need a net that's at least one pound per foot. Personally, I won't buy any net that's less than 1.3 pounds per foot, and when the shad are really tough, I throw a net that's 1.7 pounds per foot. And when it comes to the radius of the net, you'll need to check your state laws because every state normally has a different law. Here in Kentucky, we're allowed to throw up to a 10 foot net. If you want to catch the most shad possible, get the biggest net that you're physically and legally able to use and don't stop practicing until you perfect it. So I want to show you guys the difference in how fast a $150 net sinks versus a $50 net. Uh, this net right here is 3 eighths mesh. It's probably about a half pound per foot, maybe three quarter, uh, five foot radius. This is a 10 foot net. It's got 1.7 pounds per foot of weight and it's three quarter inch mesh. So we're gonna throw this net. We're gonna put the timer on it, see how long it takes to hit the bottom. And then we're gonna do the same thing with the $50 net. And I'll show you guys the difference. So I like to throw the triple load method, especially for these big heavy nets like this. If you guys want to check out the way I throw the net, I actually have a video on that. I'll put a link to it in the description. There we go. on the bottom. And now we're going to throw the cheap lightweight net. I throw these smaller lightweight nets a little different. Hopefully I'll remember how to do this. Alright, here we go. It's almost float. On the bottom. So as you guys can see, it's a pretty big difference. These nets have their place. If you're throwing a net somewhere where you know there's a good chance it's going to get hung up, you don't want to Take a chance on throwing a hundred dollar net up in there you know for sure try to throw one of these nets it's nice to have one in the boat so after you catch your bait you either want to keep it alive or you want to get it on ice immediately i prefer to keep it alive even if i plan on using it as cut bait but it is a lot of work to keep it alive so a lot of times i just put it on ice or sometimes i'll put it in a saltwater brine which really does a good job on getting the temperature of your bait down. If you want to learn more about the saltwater brine, I'll put a link in the description of a video that I actually done. I actually have a couple videos on that. But if you do want to keep your shad alive to use them as live bait, it's really not that hard as long as you have a good bait tank, as long as you keep your filters clean and do a few things to keep them healthy. I'd say probably the most important thing when you're keeping shad alive is when you catch them in your net, put them straight into the bait tank. You don't want to handle them any more than you have to. Don't dump them out on the floor of the boat. I used to put them in my boat live well previous to putting them in my bait tank because when you first catch shad, they puke and shed scales and they'll make the water in your bait tank get really dirty. 
but I think you're better off just to clean your filters more and go ahead and put them straight into the bait tank. Seems like the scales stay on them longer and they just they just stay healthy longer. So I'm gonna show you guys exactly how I set up my bait tank before I catch my bait. Most of the time I just use water straight out of the river or lake that I'm catching my bait out of. Uh, hey guys, so the first thing I'm gonna do once I get my tank filled up with water is I'm gonna add some salt. Uh, and you don't wanna use table salt, iodized salt. You wanna use all natural salt water softener salt what i'm using right here is actually pool salt that i just got at walmart i've got a 25 gallon tank i put two cups of salt in my 25 gallon tank most people recommend one cup per 10 gallons of water so uh, i don't really have a way to measure it out exact but it doesn't have to be exact i cut a piece of water bottle off it looked like to me it was around a cup What I do like about the pool salt better than the rock salt is it does dissolve really, really fast. So that'll be one, two. Now, as far as I know, guys, what this salt actually does for the shad, when you catch a shad, uh, they, their body starts going through all kinds of changes due to stress. And the stress causes a chemical imbalance and the salt helps correct that. That's about all I know about it. I don't know, I'm not a scientist, you know, I don't know a whole lot about what goes on there, but there's a chemical imbalance from stress and the salt helps correct it. But one thing I do know about the salt, guys, is it is a must have for keeping shad alive for any long period of time. A few weeks ago, we went out and caught some nice shad. I threw them in the tank. About an hour later, when I went to grab one, they were all red nosed, they didn't have a lot of energy left. I was like, man, this has never happened. You know, what's going on? Well, I, had, I realized I forgot to put salt in it. Normally, if I put salt in there, I can keep 20 or 25, 8 to 10 inch gizzard shad alive in this tank for a few days. So the salt makes all the difference in the world. And also, you got to make sure you keep your water temperature cool. I've got a little uh, fish tank thermometer in here that I just pop in and out. And I like to keep it at around 70 degrees. Uh, in the wintertime, I let it get a lot colder than that and that's fine, but I don't want it to get much over 70 degrees. So I use ice to control it. Just check that every few hours. If it's above 70, I'll put a little bit of ice in there. A lot of people don't like to add ice to their tank because they say it'll shock the bait once they take it from the tank and put it in the warm water. But I don't think 70 degrees to 80 degrees or vice versa is gonna, is gonna shock the bait. I've personally never seen it. And I've actually had my tank probably 50 degrees before by adding too much ice. Took bait straight out of the river and put them in there and they done great. So if any of you guys had any experience with bait dying due to, you know, temperature change, you know, let me know in the comments, but I personally never had that happen. Something else that I do sometimes guys is I put some ammonia lock in there. If I feel like my tank's getting really foamy or getting a lot of ammonia in it. I've never really seen a big difference from this stuff, but, uh, it definitely can't hurt none the way I look at it, so I always add a little bit to it if I feel like I need to. And if I need to do a water change or something at home, I don't have access to any uh, fresh water, I'll use tap water and I'll treat it with stress coat. Just read the directions on the back and that'll take care of everything. Something else that a lot of people like to use is foam off. Uh, but if you have a major, major foam problem, uh, you probably need to address what's causing the foam because. The way I understand it, the foam off really just kind of gets rid of the foam and doesn't solve the problem or treat the water. But I do use it sometimes uh, just to be able to see my bait down in the tank or sometimes it'll be so much foam it'll be running over in the boat and stuff making a mess. So it is nice to have some foam off around too. So the only thing that's left to do now is go out and catch you a big old fish guys. But I want to thank you guys for watching. I hope this video might help somebody out one day. If you learned something, hit that thumbs up button for me. If you like this kind of content, don't forget to subscribe. I hope you all have a wonderful week. God bless you guys, and we'll see you in the next video.